think Charles came to play tonight. And a steal. Miller retreats from the three-point line. Weber imploring the crowd. Jimmy Smith hitting the three. Big time plays here by Steve Smith. Welcome to another edition of Open Court on NBA TV. February being Black History Month, that's the focus of today's show. And here is our panel. We've got Steve Kerr, as always, and Chris Weber. Back again is Steve Smith and Charles Barkley. Reggie Miller's here. Kenny the Jet Smith is here. So is Shaquille O'Neal. I have a question. I've got, a, I've got the answer, I hope. Do you and Steve Kerr celebrate Black History Month? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Certainly we do, don't we, Steve? We do. We do. Y'all eat chillets and ham hocks and neck balls and everything? Like us guys? Certainly. Certainly. <laughs> um, and, and let me start with you, Chuck. Who, who do you consider, in NBA terms, the pioneers uh, among African Americans? Well... That's a, a, a difficult question because I think until I got to the NBA, I didn't get to see Bill Russell play, Oscar Robinson play, Earl Lloyd. You know, when you go to NBA Entertainment, you have to see those things. Because it wasn't like you had a game on every day, every week like you do now. Like, I never got to see Nate Thurman play. Uh, you know, it, it much. I, I, you know, you get a little bit of Earl Murray. I think my first recollection of watching old tape was watching Earl Monroe, Walt Frazier, and those guys play. So, uh, and like I said, I'm not like these guys are all from big cities. Like when you're in Alabama, they're not going to show anything but football. <laughs> so I had to learn. I had to go and learn about these guys once I got to the NBA. To be honest with you, you know, and I, you know, Charles jokes. To me and you, Steve, but but there's certainly uh, an understanding and an appreciation of of Black history in terms of NBA and and where the game was and where the game has yeah. has come to now. Well, you know, I, I grew up in a, a family of teachers, and my dad was a professor at UCLA. I spent a lot of time overseas um, growing up, so I, I've, I was really that was probably the best education I got was living in different cultures with different people, and and learning about life and and tolerance and and so being a sports fan and playing basketball right away, I was a huge fan of of NBA history, and I read all about, you know. Oscar Robertson and, and, and that whole era and Bill Russell and, and you know, the all-star game where the players decided to strike in two hours before the game for, for better rights. And, and it wasn't just about civil rights. It was about union rights and, and uh, player rights. But it all sort of blended together. And, but that whole era of the NBA was important not only for the, the – benefit of of the black players but but all the players who were coming up well not, i don't want to make it too deep but i just want to ask steve a question about like how, what was your cultural experience of being going from you know when you not on the court that you're a majority and then all of a sudden coming into the court and being a minority and yeah. that whole experience of being a great player right in that in that environment well you know, I went to Palisades High School in Los Angeles, which the area is predominantly white, but there was busing at the time. And so there were only two white guys, three white guys on our whole team. And so I, I was really kind of exposed uh, to basketball and integration at a, at a pretty young age. And so it was something I got used to pretty quickly. But, yeah, I mean, you know, it's different when all of a sudden I'm the minority, Right. And I used to joke with Tim Duncan. I mean, Charles was, was laughing with about us. I used to joke with Tim Duncan. We'd be on the court, you know, and it was February and, and you'd hear the announcement, you know, Black History Month is being celebrated. I'd go over to Tim. I go, Tim, shouldn't we be celebrating White History Month? I, we're the minority here. Shouldn't we be celebrating like Brent Berry becoming the first white guy to win the, the slam dunk? Yeah, right. But no, it was, a, it was definitely a, a, a great experience, I think, for, for me. And, you know, just to have everything turned around and, and 
Uh, but it, you know, it's uh, it's something that that was very important for do, me. Do you life. feel bad y'all gave us the shortest month? <laughs> <laughs> Say y'all like he was in the committee. Like Steve he was in the committee good. like, oh, let's give him hey, February. 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 Let's at give least, him February. At least you guys got a month. We didn't get anything. You guys have the hey, world. Hey, hey, listen, uh, Steve, just for the record, y'all got the other yeah. 11 months. Yeah. So did, did, he, did he get to the, to the crux of your question? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I always thought that it was interesting when I had guys on my team from different cultures and I, I, I you know we talk about pioneers and we talk about Bill Russell who's my first coach who drafted me in the NBA and I'll never forget the story because he was an eye-opener in terms of cultural experience for me um, we were talking and debating about uh, European plans influx into the NBA and you know, all of these guys coming in and then I was saying well you know how they taking jobs they're not really that good they're not true big men all of those things that we would we were talking about and he stopped me in the middle of the bus and he because he used to make me sit next to him throughout the bus as a rookie and he's wanted to school me about life and NBA and he stopped me he said grab me and he said never never say that I'm like coach what are you talking about he said as a black man you can never talk about not inclusion mm -hmm. So in there, learning, like, you, everyone talk about these basketball lessons. You learn life lessons from guys like that that went through things that you would never think that you'd ever go through. You know, it's interesting, you know, having a chance to be in Springfield and see a lot of these great players. I came into playing because Chet Walker lives in Los Angeles now, but uh, and he was in the Hall of Fame ceremony right. being inducted and so forth, and I had a chance to sit down and talk to him about playing in the 60s and 70s. And you talk about the pioneers and, and look at the posters behind us of Elgin and Bill Russell and Oscar Robinson and some of the things that they went through. Now, in today's game, if some of the things that were being said that he was, to that he was telling me, I mean, there would be riots, there would be fights, but some of the intolerance that they had to put up with, some of the comments that was made towards them that was a predominantly white audience, white fan base, and to break through and basically have to turn the other cheek because, you know, you know, thank God for Jackie Robinson, who was one of our heroes as well. It, the things that they went through that they had to sacrifice so we could sit on this couch, make millions of dollars, talk about basketball, have a great life. Those pioneers behind us, they sacrificed so much for us. It, it's, that's why I tell young players about mentors, and knowing your history, knowing where this game came from and what's afforded you the luxuries that you have now. Yeah, it did, Reggie. I think speaking on that, you know, like you said with Chet Walker, you know, my high school, I had Mel Daniels. Mm -hmm. Spencer Haywood, Mel Daniels just was inducted to the Hall of Fame. Spencer Haywood, you know, who taught me, his brother, and himself the game of basketball. Listen to the sport stories of Spencer when he wanted to go hardship. You know, he was, there was games where he said he was spit on. And the different things. Well, the name hardship comes from him. Yes, from they him. Hold, they hold but, but, of but having that guy from my neighborhood went to my high school just to learn, like you said, it's not the game of basketball, it's the game of life, what yeah. to deal with. You know, I think a lot to Spencer. You know, he taught me the good and the bad about the NBA and the game of life. Ernie, you know one really cool thing about sports? And, you know, you talk about Steve being a minority or us being a minority at some point in our life. Sports is, is the coolest thing to combat that. And when you talk to those older black guys who did all the heavy lifting with us, they always talked about the only time they felt comfortable is when they were around their teammates because they, they couldn't eat together. They stayed at different hotels. But one thing about sports, man, I've been playing basketball my entire life, and I'm from Alabama, and we got some stuff going on there. Always have and always will. You know, they, my mother and grandmother made sure I knew about racism with the church bombs and everything, the, the Selma massacre and everything with Dr. Martin Luther King. But I actually think that's one of the reasons I love playing sports the most. Because, uh, like I said, I've been doing it a long time. I've never been on a team that had any racial issue. You know, my mother used to, to talk about same thing, Chuck, the bombings and things like that. But she would, she would say to me, isn't it crazy that without sports and entertainment, America would be racist? If I'm from New York, I always use this. And we hate Cleveland. Well, I can be pre prejudiced, forget the black people in New York. But Jackie Robinson comes along, 
Now New York plays against Cleveland. Now it's us against them. So sports, what it did, nothing brings you together like a common enemy. So it lets me and Steve say, forget it. I know we're not the same, but hey, we got to beat those guys over there. And for right now, we have to have a brotherhood. And that's what I think sports has done. It's made everybody say, hold on, we're part of a team. Sports really has changed to me society because it's been an example of, hey, those two guys can hang along. The Rat Pack, those guys are all together. Hey, Charles and these guys are all together. I really think young kids take from those lessons. I really do. Because, what, Ern, let me make this one point. Because <clears throat> black, black people, first of all, America is still segregated, <clears throat> unfortunately. It's still segregated. Uh, there's a few blacks and whites sprinkled together, <clears throat> but for the most part, America still segregated. And I always, it was very interesting you go back to Spike Lee's movie, the, 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 the white guy who was really racist. And he said to him, who's your favorite singer? He says, Michael Jackson. He said, who's your favorite basketball player? He said, Michael Jordan. He said, yeah, but I hate the rest of the black people. <laughs> so I'm going to pick it back on what Chris says. Sports to me, I always tell people, man, I love sports. Sports has given me every single thing in my life. Uh, it, it made me, uh, it gave me obviously an opportunity to travel the world, hang out with uh, different ethnic groups. But sports is always, sports are really cool for what C Webb and Steve uh, just said. It, it brings us together. But what, 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 what you can't forget, and I know you want to get to Shaq, we can't forget the people that made the, pave, the pavement for us, that laid the ground for us, because it's easy for us. It's easy for right. us to get up and get in front of everyone and speak. And a lot of those players back in the, the 50s and 60s, and you talk about Mel, and I had a, a, you know, growing up with Mel 18 years with the Pacers, a lot of those players didn't have a voice. And a lot of times I feel that we're speaking for a lot of those players in yeah. the 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. and 60s. And that's what I'm so appreciative of. And every time I see them, I let them know that, that thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for me and my family. Where does your mind go as this month and in this conversation comes around, Shaq? We have to realize that, that you know, everyone that hates another person, another race is not the same. And I think Red Arbach did a great job of showing Bill Russell that. You know, Bill Russell has always been my favorite pioneer. He told me a story one time after the game, they all went to a hotel. And of course, they wouldn't let the black players there and Red Arbach had enough. And he took the whole team and they moved to a different hotel. So, you know, I just think that that, you know, people like Red Arbach, you know, showed us that everybody's not the same. I've always been the type of person that when I meet you, I'm very humorous. I like to ease your soul. So if you don't like black people, I always want to be the one, the super glue that, that make you say, okay, black people are pretty cool. So yeah, but that's, I've never that's, a, that that's 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 a little problem, though, Shaq, because they don't treat us like they treat normal black people. That's true. That's one of the problems. That's true. But that goes back to the do the right thing. Okay, but like, how do we fix it, though? Well, we, we have well, we, well first of all, we, 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 we're talking about it now, so that's important. You got to... I always Whatever say, well, that problem is with black people, you know, whether it's hate or not, we have to show them that, hey, we're not all that bad. Well, so that's why I do it my way. I think, I, let, me, let me stop you. I think that's a good spot to take a break, kind of reset, come back and pick it up right there on Open Court. to open court talking about Black History Month and and let's just pick it up where you and Shaq were having a little exchange here as we went to break what is it that you're that you think is a problem with what Shaq said well they don't <clears throat> treat first of all there are racist black people too you have to always clarify that there are some black people who are full of it too but how rich black people famous black people are treated you can't they not they're not going to treat us like they treat poor black people so that the piggyback on Reddy's point that's why we have to keep this conversation alive because there's there's uh there's white racist people and there's black racist people but the bottom line is there's two types of racism uh financial economic racism is the biggest problem we got to, uh, and, and that goes for white people, too. We got to give poor black people and poor white people economic opportunity. Charles, that starts with education. Yes, no education. question. But, but, but the public young, school system... It starts at a is, younger age. crazy now. Because if, if I look at the pie chart, there's the wealthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then there's rich. Yep. Then there's the middle class. And then there's the poor. Yes. Okay? 
And how do we help these people? Because it's really these people that have really formed and shaped America. And we've got to help these people become these people, yes. the middle class. And it all starts at a young age in the inner city, and you've got to get computers, you've got to get better yeah. teachers, you've got to get you've got to get these kids motivated. And to me, that's a part of racism yeah. too, because and there's gonna be ignorance at all levels. Yeah. No matter if you give opportunity or not. There's gonna still be people who want who choose to be ignorant. And there's gonna be two people who choose to be uneducated. But the other problem, the other, the other issue is that you have to have an opportunity to know what the opportunities are. Yeah. So for, for us, when you, when you only can be seen glorified through music, entertainment, and in the sports world, then you think those are the opportunities available for you, and those are the ones you pursue. But when you learn about other things, but a lot of for us learn about those other things once we already have made it in sports. And we go, oh, wow, I didn't know I could have done this right. engineering-wise. I could have done this. Because there's never any books written about who's the first black engineer. It's about Shaquille O'Neal. And so we never understand that those opportunities are there. But, isn't, but doesn't that idea sometimes get perpetuated these days because there is so much of an emphasis no, but on, the hey, look what you, look what you, the perpetuation hey, this is Ernie, the way to Ernie, go. Ernie, That's we, the, we, the perpetuation I, 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 listen, let me is tell you all purpose. Let me say this. You get the question? Ernie, we as black people, we got to do better. Mm -hmm. We as black people, we got to do better. We got more black men in prison than college. And I've said this before, I'm not sure because our, our black kids are brainwashed. They're picking back what Kenneth says. When you go speak to these kids, they only think they can be jocks or entertainers. They don't ever think about being doctors, lawyers, teachers, firemen, policemen. Our black kids, first of all, I want to re repeat that again. We, we as black people got to do better. I hear you, Charles, but I think also there are some African-American kids if you're not given that opportunity from a public school, obviously with your wealth, all of us can pay for a, a higher education for our kids. But if you're raised in a lower income and the mm -hmm. public school system is not up to standard to give you that opportunity, that kid's never going to get a chance other than looking another avenue as music and sports and different avenues. Because when you're talking about sports, you, you really don't have to go to school to play sports. I mean, obviously, you got to go through high school and now in college, but when you're looking at other avenues, you got to have that basis starting in kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. They're not getting awarded that opportunity. When I met Chuck, I knew I could make it to the league. I didn't play against him. I didn't do nothing. It was just a fact like, okay, this is what you look like. I take a doctor into the school and they meet a doctor. And they say, wow, what type of music do you listen to? The doctor say, Little Wayne. He's like, you listen to, like, I can be you? Or you tell a little kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? How many of you never want to wear a suit to work every day? Well, hey, here's construction. Here's this. Here's that. Here's trade schools. It's, we always put this big picture. Hey, you could be... No, how about you could be a great man, love God, take care of your family, and be honorable in society, and this is how you do it. All of us got here through hard work, and I think that needs to be the story we tell these kids, because right now, microwave, immediate gratification, I can get it tomorrow. I could just do this. And the stories that you guys have that inspire me, you... you, you accepted a Hall of Fame trophy and gave and said, my sister, if it wasn't for you, we got to start with that. Can you actually say thank you to someone? Can you actually include who's been on your team? And those are the lessons, along with everything else that you're saying. I agree, we need to let them know, because they only see us high five, and they don't see Reggie, you know, Reggie saying, if it wasn't for my sister, I wouldn't have made it. Yeah, well, that's what it comes down to, is awesome. family. Yeah. No matter whether what race you are. And that's the thing I noticed, like Reggie at the Hall of Fame ceremony recently, you know, your, your 90 year old father is there, the, mm -hmm. the, the patriarch of, of an incredibly successful family. Mm -hmm. Katrina McLean gets up and gives a, a speech, and I think her, you know, her father was there. I mean, everybody, I hear Shaq all the time telling stories about, you know, his father, you know, in, in raising him. And the, the people who inspire me the most that I've met in the NBA, a guy like Amari Stoudemire who comes from a very difficult background. Those are the guys who have reversed the cycle of their own families. And I think almost everybody here has been really blessed with a strong family because then, then you're, you've got the background, you foundation. you've got the foundation, you. you're, you're taught about the importance of education and that leads to the opportunities. So the question is, what about the kids who aren't coming from good, strong families? How do 
how do we get them those opportunities? How do we teach them, you know, those that's same foundations? They, I think that that's why have. he yeah. has foundations and Charles gives, mm -hmm. you know, those are the, when you don't have those avenues, those are when you have to seek out. And the, the, the thing that you have to understand when you're in a, growing up in an inner city, where I can speak from that standpoint, you have to grow up earlier. And meaning you have to say at nine years old, you have to learn, if you're watching this show, go, I could be something different. How can I find that place in my neighborhood to help me be something different? Good point. Where maybe when you have all your parents, you don't have to do it. But you have to make grown-up decisions when you're in the inner city anyway. When you walk into school, you're making, you making grown-up decisions oh, yeah. every single 30 seconds you're walking down that street. So you got to start learning how to make those decisions as well as now saying my future decisions and how do I get to those places. I, 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 think no, I also can, think, I mean, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. I also think, you know, the thing that we can do as professional athletes, African-Americans, businessmen, we need to, you know, reveal our secrets to the children. Because even though it was very difficult for me, the way I came up, very easy. <clears throat> Born and raised in Oak, New Jersey, saw you guys, formulated a plan, followed the dream, continued my education. And, you, you know, because if it wasn't for you guys, especially guys like you, Barkley, and guys like Wilt, I wouldn't know what I wanted to be. And like you said earlier, that was my opportunity. I could do that. I'm tall. I want to play basketball. That was my opportunity. But along the way, when you look at guys like Dave Bing, he started a business. I'm going to do that, too. When you look at other guys, you know, Simmons, Magic Johnson. Yeah, Magic Johnson right. doing it. So now, that, so now that these guys are revealing their plans, you know, I'm grabbing this. I'm grabbing that. I'm grabbing this. I'm grabbing that. So, you know, we have to let these children know that it's very difficult, but it's very easy because... I grew up hard, but now that I go back and I'm, you know, talking to my children, the way I did it, if you listen to the plan, if you follow the plan, it's very, very easy to get where you want to be. I didn't even realize when I was growing up that you're supposed to have a mom and dad at home. I always tell people, like, now that I'm grown and I understand, I was like, wow, you're supposed to have a mom and dad at home. I says, in my little hometown, it's for the black kids, I'm going to speak for them, I'm like, nobody had a mom and dad at home. And I says, wow, every girl in high school ain't supposed to be pregnant. And that's why I, kind of, I always preface that we, we, we as black people, we got to take more responsibility. We can't sell drugs. We got to get our education. We're going to have to work twice as hard because we're not getting quality, the same level of education. We're going to take a break. A lot of great answers, great ideas being shared here. See Webb, that answer goes in the Hall of Fame for open court. We'll be back. We've always been taught growing up as, as the African-American kids is how to survive. And we gotta get out of survival mode and get into strive mode. Boston Celtics have done it again. Another jewel in that crown. Chris, I'm here with Bill Russell. Bill, this must have been a great win for you. Exactly. One more time, one more time. We uh, welcome you back to open court, and I'm going to use the R word. What is it? Racism? Yeah. How does it manifest itself? Does it still manifest itself? Where do you see it, Kenny? I think uh, racism exists, obviously, but I, I think it, it all... We, all, we hit all the points. Racism starts for lack of education, lack of money, and lack of knowledge. And then you be, you're just ignorant to what, what's going on. And then you think that your way is the best way because you're not exposed to any other way. And once you expose the other ways, and, and like Steve said earlier, being exposed to being a, being a minority inside a 12-man locker, locker room, me being a, a, a majority in a 12-room locker room and then being a, a minority, you, you expose the different elements. And when you start being exposed to different things, you, all, you, you come up with this commonality and this common, denator, common de, uh, denominator that everyone wants the same thing. <clears throat> they want a good life, they want good children, a good job, and, and all the things that you want. So you, you, when you expose them more, you become less ignorant. Ernie, America, you do, you, you, do you think America's still segregated? In certain respects, yeah. Yeah. And I tell people, uh, Hollywood perpetuates the myth. Because when I'm watching television, and I'm probably sensitive to it because I'm from Alabama, I says. It pisses me off, to be honest with you. I say, well, the black guy's going to be crooks. 
the Mexicans going to be crooks, and the Muslims are going to be crook. When you watch all television, think about that, Ernie. When you watch, I, th I think you get into it. I think I think you overstate that. I think I think when you make a broad statement that every time you watch this, these guys are going to... 85% of the time. I'm sorry, 85% of the time when I'm watching television. 85% of the time. No, I'm not even... Listen, listen, I would say 85% of the time. Ernie, when I watch The Closer, and that's my favorite show, all the gang members are going to be black or Mexican. No disrespect. When I watch a movie when somebody's trying to blow up a plane, they're going to be Muslim. I mean, that's... That's a hundred... I'm not, it's close to 100%. And it, like I say, because America is still segregated, that kind of stuff, it kind of gives you a subliminal message like, well, yeah, all the blacks and Mexicans are in gangs. And a lot of them are, but not all of them. And the same thing, the Muslims uh, who I've been around have been fantastic people. But if I was just to go about what they show me on television, they'd all be uh, blowing up planes and suicide bombers. Well, here's my, here's my thing. When you'd say America is segregated. Now, look, I grew up in a family where my dad played professional baseball in the 50s. How many of those black people well, lived in your neighborhood? No, listen, listen, listen to me. Can I answer the question? Sure. I grew up with my dad playing professional baseball with the Milwaukee Braves in the 50s. And I grew up with stories from him about how he and Hank Aaron couldn't eat at the same restaurant mm -hmm. because they wouldn't let Hank Aaron in. And so they would have to, they would all leave because they knew it wasn't right. To me, that is segregation. When you can't do what you want to do because of the color of your skin, that is segregation. Well, that's subliminal, what, Ernie. No, it's listen, different. It's a different... Are you, are you, gonna, are you gonna let me answer the question? It's, it's Hold on, Kenny, no, Kenny, I'm just telling you where I've been. Okay, what I learned from my dad growing up mm -hmm. about, about, about episodes of blatant segregation where Henry Aaron and other black players on the Milwaukee Braves could not eat. That's could racism. Not, could not go to the bathroom. That's and, racism. And it's segregation No, no, well. I, I, I'm talking about where we I'm, live, I'm, Ernie. I know, but I'm, just, I'm, but, I'm saying, but I'm saying this too, that when I see the fact that we are all sitting here on this show together and I look out at our crew members and we have every mix you can possibly want, I say not everything is segregated. Because we're on top of the food chain, Ernie. We're in the game. We're all successful. We, this is a company. All these people are successful. Yeah, the, the higher you up on the food chain, the more diversity you're going to get. But I'm talking about when you go, when you travel this country, when you go to certain neighborhoods, the blacks on one side of town, the Mexicans on one side There's of town. There's no white kids I, I, no, living I on Martin that. Luther I, King Boulevard. No question. Ain't none. Listen, I, no, I, I, see, I see what you're saying about in that. any state. And that's what city. I mean by segregation. That's just yeah. blatant racism. That's just ignorant. You have to go to different bathrooms and different restaurants. But I'm talking about people's subliminal message in this country is we don't all live together. Well, uh, uh, we just don't. Hey, Chuck, and you're 100% yeah. right on this. And think about this. And we can all say this. And you say we, we're all diverse in the cameras. Who go to church on Sunday? Just think about your church members. <laughs> your church members are all one ethnic background because they're all living in one area and then segregated in it. And this is the place where everybody is saying that we're supposed to be all together. That's a cultural thing. I mean, no, but we're both Christians. No, no, but we're all no, Christians. No, we, but I'm saying, see, they live close to their church. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying, it ain't, they, they ain't living in no mixed neighborhood. Uh, Charles, I, you made, I think, the best point. In this, in this whole discussion so far when you said that racism is really about economics. And, and, and Ernie, you, you talked about the diversity here in this room. I think we've come an incredibly long way. Oh, no, no question. Country. I don't think people care as much about color of skin. I mean, there's, there's, it's the biggest melting pot on earth. Steve, you're, 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 Latino, really, you're but, really great, and you're different, though. No, I'm but really I'm going to you really but but, you are, are, You're not... You're, you used to think that you would be a... Uh, uh, you're an oddity in the sense that because you are what you are. But, let, but there is a, a culture that we aren't exposed to because we are, he's Reggie Miller and he doesn't have, he doesn't go through, he's Shaq. That is a culture that no, doesn't you're, think And you're right, it. and I totally agree. But let, let me, my, my, my point was once you get beyond how far we've come, 
which is dramatic given what, you know, Ernie's story 50 years ago, black people couldn't even eat in certain restaurants. So we've come an incredibly long way, but the problem goes back to economics, as Charles said, and that's why the, the, the middle class shrinking, shrinking. over the last I, 50 years is the biggest problem we have in this country because it perpetuates everything we're talking about in this panel. It keeps people segregated. It doesn't allow opportunities. You talk about our racism because we've all dealt with this. Whether you walk into a jewelry store and they lock the doors behind you and the officer is following you around to DWB, driving while black, you get pulled over just because, to the Trayvon Martin case. You know, if you're wearing a hoodie, okay, you must be a gangbanger. So most of us on this panel have experienced that at some point in time in our life. Or still do. Or still do. Well, definitely DWB. <laughs> definitely, you know. But... It, it can't be an excuse. And that's the point I'm making. And, when, you know, you made a good point about, you know, growing up, and I didn't know you were supposed to have a, a mother and father in the household. But you didn't use that as an excuse. No. Because you still prevailed over that. I, I can't speak for, for Shaq, but I'm a military, just like he is, and I grew up on different bases before we settled on in California. So I was fortunate to be around all nationalities and races, which which helped, you know, my tolerance and to learn about different cultures and so forth. So you've got to take your upbringing and, you know, if, if kids are watching this show and they want to take, oh, my God, there's Charles Barkley, there's Steve Kerr, there's Shaq. I want to be a baller. I want to be a rapper. I want to be an entertainer. It, when you look at this, this show, it's not about that because there's no excuses. Because if you don't grow up in a household with a computer and your lacking education school system doesn't have computers, there's public libraries. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got to get Not out there. How many public libraries left, though? Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but you can them. find them. No, there, you, can, you can't find you them. You can find them. There was four libraries that was in walking distance for me. There's not a library in my neighborhood now that it's in walking distance. So you're going to ask a kid could go from my neighborhood to walk to the other neighborhood. Yes, it's an opportunity. But what you have to go through to get to that neighborhood, you might decide not Good to point. go to. So I'm looking at is when you take those libraries away, you take an opportunity away. And I think that's where it starts to come from, where there's public schools in Detroit. They're closing down. There's there, high schools closing down so much now where there's kids that's choosing not to go to the other high school because it's in the other neighborhood. And that's the opportunity that's taken away from these kids. One thing, Steve, just like those people in black history, just like the people up here, it's like if like nobody really cares. That's what I want to, that's what I actually tell the kids. If I can honestly tell you that nobody cares, what would you do? Like your school's gonna get closed down. Just like the basketball players over here on this side, I said, if your gym get closed down, what y'all do? Y'all said y'all go 10 miles and play outside and you'll do a bunch of things. I just want them to know that you're right, no one cares. You can't use excuses. But if you know these at the core of your system, then love yourself so much to try to find out early at nine. Hey, I'm interested in this, and Kenny did this. Let me research it, because it's so much on these kids to do it themselves. And so if kids are watching, I'll tell you this. We can all talk about the first time we dunked, the first time we did this, but I know they shot a lot of jumpers. I know they worked hard in the post. I know, so EJ wouldn't be here just because you could joke. It, it worked into it, and sometimes it just seems easy. And so if no one's going to care, if no one's going to be there, hopefully these kids will take it upon themselves and say, the world doesn't care, I got to learn, I got to do it. Because until the government says something bigger about public schooling, about, about all these things in which we don't have a hand in, it's really up to the kids. Can I just say, there's one point. We, everybody got great points. But I, I, the most important thing what I said today was, we, we as black people, we got to do better. Listen, it ain't white guys selling drugs in our neighborhood. It ain't white guys coming in, shooting up the hood every weekend. It's other black people. We have become our own worst enemy. Yeah, I think that the other thing is that we've always been taught growing up as, as the African-American kids is how to survive. And we got to get out of survival mode and get into strive mode, meaning when you, you're in survival mode, you might do things that you, that's uncharacteristic of what you really are. But when you're in strive mode and you're striving to do something, you, then you'll pick the things that make you go further. And once we start teaching the kids to get out of survival mode and get into strive mode, I think we'll be all right. Shaq, close the segment out for us. I mean, <clears throat> I always tell people that I think the world would be a better place if everyone stepped up. Like, you, you know, 
I think if we all do our part, we could not, not eliminate the problem, but we could start to fix it. If every big time person talked to a school or if every big time person gave a speech or if every big time person and it stepped up and spread their message, uh, you know, the world would be a better place because it's not going to it's not going to stop until we fix it. And when I say we, I mean everybody. I mean the nation. I mean the government, the president, until we as people step up. It's always going to be there. It's open court on NBA TV. You love your teammates. You're like, I ain't never said, oh, dude's white. Oh, dude's Jewish. Dude's Hispanic. Like, when you play sports, you're like, can he play? Can he play? Wrapping up Open Court here on NBA TV and a reminder that you can catch more on NBA.com. So here's an interesting question. Kenny, who's the first person of another race you trusted? Uh, my coach. Who was? Uh, Tom Donahue. Uh, he was the first coach that was an African-American that coached me. And How I old trust, were you? I was um, 11. 11 years old, um, and he was the first one I trusted because I put something in his hands that I thought was valuable, my career, or what I want to do and what I want to be. So I trusted something that was valuable to him, and he didn't take advantage of it, he didn't abuse it, and he actually helped me with it. And he actually helped me get into Archbishop Malloy High School. He, he brought me and exposed me to things that I wasn't exposed to before, so he was the first person that actually so I gave it to. Up until your ninth grade, and up now, until 12, 13 years old, yeah. Yeah, I was 13. Now, there, there wasn't one white man, white lady? That, that... I entrusted. Mm-hmm. No. Because I grew up in a, you know, a left rack city, which is at that time was predominantly black, uh, Queens. So I didn't entrust because it, it was funny. We were just talking in the break. When I grew up, I never had seen a, a black doctor, lawyer, or anything like that. And I would grow up, I'm an 80s, 90 kid. I'm not like... 1950s, I had never seen it. And even in my neighborhood was mostly black. I had never seen a black cop. So I didn't even think you could be a police officer and be black. So those things were not, so I didn't trust none of those people because they were different and they never, it seemed like they trusted me. Mm -hmm. So I, ne I never trusted them. But the first one was Tom Dunahue. Shout out to him. Archbishop Malloy to North Carolina. That was the guy who got me there. First guy I ever trusted. Do you have a story like that, Rich? No, I don't because I, I, I grew up on so many military bases, and we, I mean, all nationality and races from black, white, Asian, everyone we met and came into contact with, so it, it, was, it wasn't foreign to me. So to say who was the first white I trusted, that's a very loaded question, um, because I didn't look at it at that, because when you're three, four, five, six, seven, and you are around a lot of different people where you're yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, and you come from that background, there's so much respect there. Um, I, I trusted everyone of every nationality and race. Shaq? Uh, I'm sort of like Reggie, grew up on a military base. Uh, it's not that I didn't trust him, I probably didn't see him growing up in Newark, New Jersey. Left New Jersey when I was 12 and we moved to Fort Stewart, Georgia. First white person I loved was my fourth grade teacher, Miss Swan. Rest in peace. Uh, she was the one that, I mean, because even now I'm a class clown, so I was always a class clown, but she was the first lady that pulled me to the side and said, son, you can be bigger. You can be bigger than basketball. You can be this. You can be a doctor. You can be a lawyer. If you just focus, if you just stay focused and stay out of trouble, you can be whatever you want to be. So that was the first white person I love. Charles. The guy, probably the greatest friend I've ever had, his name is Pep Mock. We played together in high school. Because, like I say, being from Alabama, y'all go to school together, then y'all go both go back to y'all side of town. He was the first white friend of mine who invited me to his house across town. His family treated me like I was their son. He's one of my best friends still to this day. And like I say, the, the different the dynamic of the South is like y'all just live on different sides of town. Y'all go to school, y'all look cordial to each other. But once school is out, we'll see you. Then you disappear for the summer. Uh, but this guy Joseph Pep Mock, he's been his family, and they they treated me like I was their son. Well, do you do you remember? 
what you were feeling before you went. It's one thing to hang with a guy at school or go to basketball practice and go home. Do you remember what you were thinking before you made that trip over to that house? Or what, what is this going to be like? I, I was like, because I remember telling my mom, I said, uh, one of my teammates invited me over to his house. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, I want to go. He's a great guy. She said, well, what about his parents? I says, I'm going to get to meet them for the first time. And I, I, I was excited because, Ernie, as I said earlier, man, sports, uh, like, like I said, I've been playing sports my whole life. I've been truly blessed. But, like, I've never been around another ethnic group because, like, you love your teammates. you like, I never said, oh, dude's white. Oh, dude's Jewish. Dude's Hispanic. Like, when you play sports, you're like, can he play? Can he play? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a unique Can thing. I think Steve and all the guys touched on it earlier. Man, when you play sports, I'm like, I'm going to kick it to Steve, and he's going to make the shot. I ain't thinking, like, oh, I'm passing the ball to the white guy. Like, that never comes up. <laughs> that never comes up. You're like, dude, we just playing ball. If you could do that, you're really good. <laughs> you can figure out who's who. Yeah. Was there any kind of a moment growing up, Steve? Uh, I think from one, I think, first of all, I, I think my whole community, even though my community is African-American dominance, and I think when you start to look at another race, Mr. Hainer was probably the first as another race, my dim teacher growing up in Kona Gardens. But I think the first of trust and learn about a different race was my college roommate, Jeff Weber. Uh, we became roommates because Michigan State recruited two guards. One of us wasn't going to play. And by putting us in a room together, we had to separate. So... I, I got a, a student, not a student athlete, and, and Jeff Weber was white. And then for him, to, for us to learn each other's culture, I think I would say that's the first, you know, from another race would be Jeff Weber. I had a crazy story. I grew up and I had friends of all races, uh, but I, it was an all-white high school I had to go to. And so for my community, so I black, I wanted to represent Detroit. I wanted to be like Steve, other guys. I wanted to go play with Jalen at a public school. So I'm going to this other school, and here, you know, I'm a poor kid here. Tuition is, I don't know, a lot of money. You got to wear a suit and tie. Everybody has money. And so in my mind, as a ninth, a ninth grader, I'm like, I got to go to this white school. They got all this stuff there. The first day I get to school, they break in this girl's car, and it's really her father tricking her and giving her a new car with a bow on top and all this. So it was the intimidation of the system, of the white system or whatever it was. And going into the school, I did not want to be there. I did not trust anyone be around it. We had, you know, a large Arabic population, Asian, white population. And what I found out, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It taught me how to interact. It taught me that this kid is rich, but he's a jerk. This kid is black, but he's crazy. This kid is white, he's cool. Like Chuck said, it's crazy black, crazy white, everything. And so that intimidating environment for me was like, oh, I'm cool, I got this. It's the same, girls are the same, guys are the same. You know, it's the same 10% jerks over here, the same 10% smart guys, all that stuff. So for me, it was really, nerve-wracking going into that environment. And uh, when I got out of it, it was really one of the best things my parents ever made me do. How about it, Steve? Similar story. I mean, just, you know, in high school, um, I mentioned earlier Palisades High School, the school was 50% black. Um, so my teammates, you know, Carl Washington, Dwayne Ridgeway, Kevin Stewart, these guys were, were my guys because we were, we were playing together. We were in the locker room together every day. And so the, the trust and the bond that develops through sports just transcends race and so you know trusting a teammate was pretty natural regardless of you know color or race so Ernie, your dad's story kind of brings this thing all together like when i talked to bill russell another night uh uh who does bob kuta stand up for uh at the hall of fame don barksdale mm -hmm. he like man the white guys in in your dad's era they took care of the brothers mm -hmm. You know, because when you own that team, man, you feel that. You know, I mean, Mr. Barks there, you know, he talked about him being the first black this, first black that, and he couldn't play in the beginning because they were, they could only have one black on the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, and Mr. Cousa, when he got there, he like, hey, he took care of me. And that, man, that is what Steve just said. was like, man, when you're on a team, man, it's, it gives me, like, chills right now. Like, some of the white guys I play with, man, they're, like, part of my family. Mike Jemisky, Dan Marley. I mean, they're, like, part of my family. Uh, I got much love for them. And I think, yeah, I mean, sports has this way of breaking down barriers that stand there. It, um, it's the great equalizer, uh, Ernie, because there's one common goal. 
and that's to win and win a championship. So, you know, for all these guys that's been on the biggest stage and have won championships and been on the biggest stage and lost those championships with white and black guys, the tears are all the same. You know, you're all in the same huddle. So that's what makes sports fantastic is it, race has nothing to do with it because there's one common goal. Yeah, back in back in 91, uh, I've been working at Turner for two years. And this is this is more of a political thing. Um, you know, the United States and Cuba had no relations. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to we're not allowed to travel to Cuba. But for that summer, we at Turner were allowed to travel to Cuba because the Pan American games were going on down there mm -hmm. and I'm getting to do baseball and you go down there and you see these fans who show up four hours before the first pitch and the stadium is absolutely packed and you're talking around the batting cage in you know he can't understand me very well <laughs> this Cuban and I can't understand him very well but we're gesturing and we're talking baseball behind a batting cage in Cuba where our country says you can't go because our political views are not the same as theirs but in that moment you're sitting there saying you know what sports just broke down all this stuff our countries can't see eye to eye on on, on anything yeah. but for a couple hours here everything's cool I'm a baseball fan you're a baseball fan and the world got a little bit smaller that day for me and I think sports you can't you can't understate the impact that being a teammate, being in a sport, being able to rub shoulders with a guy of a totally different background and upbringing. But for those times, you know, the world gets smaller. And, uh, and I think on this month uh, that we look at uh, the Black History Month, uh, I think it serves us well to remember that, that, uh, that we're blessed to be on a team. We've got a team here. But, uh, I'd do anything for any one of you guys, and you know it. Only reason why I joined this team, I thought you were black in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I know you hear that a lot. And I, and, I, and I still get that question. And that's a show for another day. It's open court on NBA. Can I say Santa Claus is the first white guy I trusted? <laughs> <laughs> he was good to me. <laughs>